Good evening, I'm Charles Edwards and welcome to WABE.org. I'm the Assistant News Director for 90.1 FM WABE and tonight I'm your moderator for our transportation sales tax referendum debate. On July 31st, voters in 10 metro Atlanta counties will decide if they want to start paying a 1% sales tax for transportation projects throughout metro Atlanta. That's what tonight's debate is all about. Before you vote on the 31st, we want you to know what the tax is, what it will pay for, why some people support it, and why some are against it. And that's why we've asked three people to join us for the next hour. First in our panel, we have Jeff Dickerson. Jeff is a communications consultant for Citizens for Transportation Mobility, also known as Untie Atlanta. Untie Atlanta is supporting the tax. Next to Jeff, we have Steve Brown. Steve is a Fayette County Commissioner. He's also with the Transportation Leadership Coalition, also known as Traffic Truth. Traffic Truth is against the tax. And last but not least, we have Jane Hayes. Jane is the Transportation Director for the Atlanta Regional Commission. The ARC is not taking a stance for or against the tax. Jane is here to provide information and explain how TSPLOSC went from an idea to a referendum. Before Jane gives that information, here's the format for tonight's debate. Each panelist will give a two to three minute opening statement. Then Jane will get us up to speed on how we got here. Then we'll open it up to questions. And some of the questions came from a list compiled by WABE News. Other questions came straight from you. And if you did not get a chance to ask your question before the debate, don't worry. You can do it in a couple of different ways. You can ask your question right now on WABE.org or you can tweet your question to at WABE News. Make sure you use the hashtag WABE Debate at the end of your question. Or you can leave your question on our wall on the WABE News Facebook page. During the debate, as moderator, I'll give panelists time for response and rebuttal. And at the end of the hour, we'll wrap up the debate with closing statements from our panel. Now let's start with the opening statements. First, Jeff Dickerson from Untie Atlanta. Thank you so much, Charles. Thank you for having us here this evening and for uh, giving us all an opportunity and giving your listeners an opportunity to hear about this very important vote on July 31st. We appreciate it. It's an important vote. It's an unprecedented vote. It's the first time that we will vote as a region, a 10 county region, uh, for anything. Uh, um, so uh, in, in that way, I think that it's really important uh, it is historic for metropolitan Atlanta. We are coming together as a region to solve one of our biggest problems. Transportation is our biggest problem. It is our biggest impediment to growth. It will stunt our growth in the future if we don't do something about transportation and the congestion that is choking our region. We've got folks who are spending thousands of dollars each year because they're stuck in transit, in, in traffic. And we've got businesses that can't move goods and services for the very same reason. We have a, trend, a congestion tax that we're paying that is astronomical. And if we come together and invest, we can manage it in a way that we currently can't manage it at all. We're paying more than $924 per person per commuter in this region because we are wasting fuel and we're wasting time. And we're paying more for goods and services that are delivered to our residences and our businesses for the very same reason, because those deliveries are stuck in traffic. We're paying more than we ought to be paying. And if we come together as a region and invest, we'll be able to control our destiny. We'll be able to bring more businesses to Atlanta. We'll be able to create more jobs and we'll create a better future for new generations of people who want to come here and invest and build. Jeff, thank you for your opening statements. Now to Steve Brown for his opening statements. Thank you, Charles. And I'd also like to thank WABE for, for hosting this event. I love getting it out there to the public and hopefully everyone will make a sound decision on July 31st. And one of the things that I'd like to bring up, if you'll recall during the Clinton administration, uh, when he was running for office for the very first time, they had to post a banner in the campaign headquarters and they said it's the economy stupid and uh, to get everybody focused on what was really important in that campaign uh, the economy obviously is still very important today but I think one of the things that we're looking at with this it's the project list itself um, people with the transportation leadership coalition and various other groups that oppose the referendum 
uh, are not opposed to projects that relieve traffic congestion. That was the mandate of the law, which was House Bill 277. Uh, it was to relieve traffic congestion in metropolitan Atlanta. Uh, unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of economic development projects that got snuck in the, in the list. And we're also seeing a lot of transit projects that, quite frankly, don't measure up uh, in terms of the bang for the buck. So there are several really large complications that we have. First of all, a lot of the transit projects that are in there, uh, the, the Clifton Corridor, some of the big rail projects going to Cobb, um, those projects aren't fully funded. Um, so I'm really taken aback by the fact that some people are, are intimating that there's projects that are going to be constructed which actually will not be constructed. The funding is not there to do it. The voters need to be aware of that. Um, the other thing is um, you have operations and maintenance costs that come with expanded mass transit. Uh, if you look today, MARTA is approaching $3 billion in red ink for maintenance alone. Uh, they're losing significant amounts of money uh, in the hundreds of millions of dollars on operating costs annually. Um, what is it going to do to that system if you expand the system by another $3.2 billion? We've asked the governor's advisors, we've asked the Speaker of the House, we've asked Todd Long with the Georgia Department of Transportation, what is the plan for funding the future operations and maintenance of those facilities? And it's going to be in the billions of dollars. And unfortunately, there is no answer. So that is a very significant and fundamental problem that we're going to have to address. Now, as far as the referendum itself, I'm, I'm fairly disappointed the, the Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce and some other organizations are giving us the ultimatum that it's this referendum or nothing at all. And I don't buy that for a second. Um, I think there are other opportunities. Uh, matter of fact, the law itself says we can come back in two years and do it again. And we believe that's what we ought to do with a much improved and much enhanced list. All right. Well, Steve, thank you for your opening statements. And finally, Jane Hayes from the Atlanta Regional Commission. Thank you so much, Charles. I really appreciate being here today. I just want to explain the context of why we are doing this now, why we are having this option to fund uh, certain projects uh, right now. Atlanta has experienced phenomenal population growth through the 1980s, the 90s, the 2000s. We're at 5 million people now. During the 80s, we, were, we benefited from major federal partnerships for expanding our transit system, for expanding our interstate system. But we forecast to grow another 3 million people by the year 2040. And believe it or not, 2040 is only 28 years away. And some of the projects in this project list we've been talking about for probably 28 years ago, that'll bring our population up to about 8 million people. Uh, again, how do we fund transportation infrastructure in this country and in this state? It's primarily through a gas tax. Well, cars have become 40% more fuel efficient. We actually collectively are driving less per person. And so that model for funding is not sustainable. The funding is actually going down. And in fact, the transportation bill, reauthorization bill that was just passed by Congress, MAP 21, and signed by the President last Friday, is only a two-year bill because Congress could not come up with a way to fund beyond two years. So we really have a tremendous uh, challenge in this country about how we're going to fund infrastructure in the future. So in addition to that, Georgia is 48th in spending per capita on transportation. Uh, we have some of the nation's worst bottlenecks. The Atlanta Regional Commission produces long-range transportation plans. It's one of our missions that we do. We're federally required to do that. Ever since the early 2000s, we have noted that funding is not sustainable and we have far more needs than we have money to pay for the projects. And in fact, the last plan that was adopted last summer, we identified over $66 billion worth of needs that we don't have the money to pay for. Those are projects that have already been identified and are on the books. So this is an opportunity uh, for folks to decide if this is a way that they would like to fund transportation in the future. Um, should um, the 
citizens of the Atlanta region decide that, it would provide an opportunity for projects to uh, come online much sooner than are in existing plans now, sometimes um, 30 years sooner than what we have in existing plans. So it's really um, a decision that the voters will have to make, um, but that really sets the context in a broad sense about why we're here. And so now that you've heard the opening statements from our panel, we want to remind you that you are watching a transportation sales tax referendum debate on WABE.org. I'm Charles Edwards, Assistant News Director for 90.1 FM WABE. Now that you've heard some of the opening statements, if you have a question or comment about the transportation sales tax referendum, you can ask it right now on WABE.org. We will try to get to your question tonight. And you can also tweet your question to our Twitter account at WABE News. Please use the hashtag WABE Debate at the end of your tweet. Or you can leave your question on our Facebook page, which is WABE News. Um, I know that uh, Jeff and Steve, you all said some things that I want to follow up on, and I'm sure you guys have your rebuttals already ready <laughs> for that. But before we get to that, Jane, I want you to kind of elaborate a little bit on what you just talked about. and. Sure. This was a bill that started in the General Assembly, this whole idea about a transportation sales tax in 2008. So a lot has happened from 2008 to now. Sort of catch us up to, to what has happened and how we got to this list that we have. I'll be glad to, Charles. In fact, even prior to 2008, um, the General Assembly um, had a transportation study commission that went around the state to ask all over the state what needs to be done about transportation. Then in 2008 and 2009, the General Assembly debated various options for funding transportation, uh, some statewide, some at a regional level, sales tax, uh, developing a project list uh, at the General Assembly level, allowing local governments to develop a project list, all kinds of options were put on the table. And ultimately, the successful option in terms of what the General Assembly passed was the Transportation Investment Act in 2010. Prior to that, in 2009 as well, the state completed the statewide strategic transportation plan, which was developed by McKinsey and Company that developed the business case for transportation and why transportation is so important for Georgia's economy. And on, so on the heels of that, the Transportation Investment Act was passed in 2010. Um, following that, the act itself lays out the entire process of how the project list should be developed. And what that entailed was that a regional roundtable be formed. And that regional, for each region, for our uh, at 10 county metro Atlanta area, the regional roundtable was made up of the county commission chair, of each of the 10 counties, plus a mayoral representative from each of the 10 counties, plus the mayor of Atlanta. So it was a bipartisan regional roundtable to develop a project list. So the director of planning for Georgia DOT ultimately um, asked for nominations from all the local governments of projects. And criteria was developed by the regional roundtable of what should be, the, in, those pro what should be in the project list. One of the key criteria was that projects come from existing plans and studies because what they did not want to see just a, a, a rogue project out there that came out of nowhere. So, so these projects um, have all come from existing plans or studies that have been done by professional engineers and planners um, over the past few years. That original list was $23 billion. The roundtable had to take that list down in 2011 dollars, non-inflated dollars, to a little over $6 billion. Last summer, uh, 2011, um, the whole summer was spent hearing from the public, telephone town halls that reached uh, almost 200,000 people, focus groups, public meetings in each county, uh, public participation at every roundtable meeting. There were over 14 roundtable meetings held, and ultimately they came up with um, a project list in October of 2011. It's 157 regional projects. So I think that helps you understand the chronology of how we got to where we are through the basically um, a study from all over the state, the General Assembly um, developing this, the statewide strategic plan, and then ultimately a project list that was developed for the region. So part of this included a study to see what was the business case for transportation and how there is a tie 
from transportation to business. That actually leads into a question that we got earlier in the day from Stephen Elrod, uh, who responded on Twitter to at WAB News. Um, he wanted to know when corporations are looking to grow their businesses by building in a new city, do they really consider traffic that much? Uh, Jeff, with Untie Atlanta, is this something that businesses have been asking for uh, as far as, uh, as it relates to their business? Oh, I, we, we know that we've lost hundreds of jobs because of traffic congestion and the image of traffic congestion in metropolitan Atlanta. There's no question about it. That's what people are looking for. Nobody wants to come here, and their employees don't want to come here if they're stuck in traffic. And so it's a big issue with companies coming to Atlanta. It's a big issue with doing business in Atlanta once you get here. It makes it more costly. What we're trying to do is create efficiencies, and we have to have have an efficient transportation system to have an efficient economy in our region. We just have to do it. And so, yes, I think that it makes a huge difference in whether or not a company is going to locate in Atlanta. We know that it does, but more than that, we've got to figure out what kind of image we are going to set for the nation and the world. You know, on, on August 1st, are we going to have headlines in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times that say that we couldn't come together as a region to support a sensible investment in transportation. And if we make that decision, what message does that send to business? I think that we need to think about that. On August 1, if the headline is, we've turned this down, it sends a very clear signal to businesses around the nation and the world that they need to consider other places. We're losing jobs. You know, people are arguing about whether or not this is going to create 200,000 jobs or 140,000 jobs. That doesn't even count the number of jobs we will lose to companies that won't come here and will go to other regions. Steve Brown with the Transportation Leadership Coalition. If we do not vote for TSPLOST on July 31st, are we shooting ourselves in the foot as far as economic uh, uh, development here? Well, I'll tell you, Charles, I, th I would like to see the headline in the Wall Street Journal be, we finally stood up to special interest when we finally forced a good referendum that included decent projects on the next go around. Um, we have a system, unfortunately, uh, which has been very deficient from a land planning and transportation perspective. Um, unfortunately, we didn't pay attention to a lot of our surface road network. If you look at Dallas, which often is the comparison that people use, Dallas and Charlotte, Dallas has a wonderful grid network, and they're working on it and proving that. Um, unfortunately, we're putting $3.2 billion into transit, which has a very low ridership, and the ridership is declining constantly. So, you know, all that being said, um, yes, traffic does play a key, and I think that's why most of your new business startups and whatnot are happening in the suburban areas. People don't want to go to downtown Atlanta and, and fight that traffic on the connector. However, one thing that you need to be, uh, t pay attention to is it also includes water, because water is the biggest issue in Atlanta. It's not traffic. The ability to supply water to our citizens in future years is the biggest issue. Traffic might be number two. Now, the other one is schools, quality of life, crime. And if we don't take care of those as well, uh, we're putting ourselves in a hole. But let me give you a perfect example, if I could, briefly. There was a large heavy equipment manufacturing company from China that wanted to settle in the United States of America. And they were looking for a spot. They looked all over the United States. They narrowed it down to two choices. One was San Francisco, which has BART, one of the most efficient, most functional mass transit systems in the United States. The other one was Peachtree City, Georgia, in my Fayette County, which has no transit. They chose Peachtree City. It was quality of life. It was excellent schools. And, uh, and an incredibly low crime rate, one of the lowest in the nation. That helped draw them to Peachtree City. There are no trains, there are no buses there. So in, in, your, in your words, you know, this is an issue that affects business, but what you're saying, if I'm hearing you correctly, spend the money not on rail, spend it on roads and other projects that you think are more adapt to businesses coming to a region. Is that what you're saying? Charles, one, one of the greatest deficits in this process, there's no cost-benefit analysis on all the projects. If you ran a cost-benefit analysis on the transit projects, they would be kicked out of the list. Some of them would be kicked out of the list almost instantly. Some of the economic development projects would be kicked out like the Beltline as well. Um, but the one, thing, one factor, and I'm living proof of this, my wife and I, we lived in downtown Atlanta in the Morningside neighborhood. And we enjoyed it. 
We enjoyed that lifestyle. We had children, and we were not going to use that school system. We were worried about the crime, and we moved to the suburbs. So unless you handle some of these other issues, it doesn't matter what the transportation system is, you're still not going to keep high-income, affluent people who are trying to raise a family in those areas unless they can afford the finest private schools. Jeff, Steve is making the point that transportation is one issue but not the only issue. I know that you all and we're focused on transportation with this, but is that a factor that plays into the traffic congestion and the problems that we have in Metro Atlanta? You know, there are many factors. Of course, transportation isn't the only issue. It is a major issue. There's no question that it's a major issue, but this notion that the suburbs are growing and the city is, is stalling is, a, is not true. You know, between 20 and, uh, 20, 2010 and 2011, the city grew at a pace of 2.4 percent, the suburbs at a pace of 1.3 percent. Who was, was fueling that growth? Young people and young families moving into the city of Atlanta. Why? Because they want transportation options. They don't want the gridlock. And they want the kinds of options that transit can provide. We keep hearing over and over again that only 4% of people in the region use transit. Let me tell you, we wouldn't have the Olympics and the $3 billion that it brought to our region were it not for transit and the ability to move people around in this region. We wouldn't have the kind of hospitality industry and convention industry that we have here if we couldn't get people from the airport to the city and around this region. And that is because of transit. Transit fuels our economy to the extent that hospitality and conventions fuel our economy. And so there's no question, when you hear this number that 4%, it's just, it's about what people here are doing now. But look at this, look at this number from the National uh, Household Travel Survey. Between 2001 and 2009, the number of young people Ridership among young people aged 16 to 34 on transit increased 40 percent over eight years. Federal Highway Administration says that the number of young people, 34 and younger, who don't have driver's licenses has gone up from 21 percent to 26 percent. We're trying to build a transportation system not just for us, but for future Atlantans. Jane is talking about you know, forecasts, 2040, 2050, and the needs that we have. I don't know if I'm gonna be here in 2040, 2050. <laughs> I hope that my children will be. And I hope that we'll be able to attract people to our region who wanna come here, build jobs, build families, and stay. But in order to do that, we're going to have to fit their lifestyles. And by investing in transit, and investing in transportation in a balanced manner, the way we're doing right now, this is what our parents did for us a generation ago. And so it's a question of whether or not we're going to be selfish and just look at the tax that we're paying now, or whether we're going to be able to make the kinds of investments that are going to fuel our economy and our growth and attract people and businesses and residents and families in the future. We'll pick up on this issue of uh, traffic congestion and economic development later on in the debate. Let's get to some more of the questions. And to remind people, you can ask your question right now at wabe.org. You can also tweet your question to at WABE News. Use the hashtag WABE Debate at the end of your tweet. Or you can also leave your questions on our wall on our Facebook page, which is WABE News. Uh, let's get to a question from WABE.org. This is from Christy Resnick. Um, she says to the man from the Transportation Leadership Coalition, Steve Brown, what specific projects would not help Atlanta? Well, I think the economic development projects per se would help the jurisdictions in which they're located. But the mandate of the bill was to relieve traffic congestion. The executive committee of the RTR was given specific instructions to select the projects that most optimized traffic congestion relief. Economic development projects don't belong in there. Now, I'll give you an example, and it's the most contentious project in the whole list, the Atlanta Beltline. Um, the supporter report says that the Atlanta Beltline was designed to rehab 42 in-town neighborhoods and to develop transit, I mean, develop and create development along a future 22-mile transit loop. Now, notice the word future development, future transit loop. There's nothing there in terms of traffic congestion and, and the need to, to resolve anything within that belt line. That project is $609 million. A lot of people outside the city of Atlanta think that's a slap across their faces. And they want projects that are going to improve commutes 
and that project does not improve the regional commute. But let me just play the devil's advocate yes. for a second here. It could, could it be in a situation, because I knew you, I, you used the example earlier in the debate about a company that relocated to Peachtree City yes. as opposed to San Francisco, which has a major transit system. Could it be that you've got uh, the suburbs is a different anomaly all to itself as opposed to the city where rail might benefit the city more than it might benefit the suburbs? You have to have population density in order for transit to work. That's why these plans, putting rail out into the suburbs is pie in the sky. You do not have the population density to make it work. Any student of mass transit will tell you that. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, the cost benefit analysis for all the transit projects that are on the list, all of them, you're only looking at 74,800 boardings. That equates to, if you look at a one-way trip up and a one-way trip back, that equates to 35,000 riders. Now let me ask you, where did you get these figures from? These are ARC numbers. Okay. Um, we checked the daily commuter numbers with ARC. We said, is two million a fair number? And uh, Kwan Hong Kim <laughs> said that, yes, that is a, a legitimate number, two million commuters. So if you do the math with the boardings and the riders that you have, you're only $3.2 billion of the list is only going to 1.8% of Atlanta commuters. Now, Jeff, now, now, I will say, if I could, let me finish that. Because the cost per rider is $90,000 per rider. And that's what I'm talking about. You have to have a cost-benefit analysis if you're going to make intelligent plans. Yeah, Steve's now, numbers, I respect Steve and the work that he does in Fayette County, but those numbers are stuck in time. We're building transit for the future. I was talking about young people who are trying to make decisions about how they will live and where they will live in the future. And the Beltline is exactly what they're looking for. More transit is exactly what they're looking for. And in 20 years, we're not going to have the Beltline here next year or in five years. But in 20 years, it's going to be a perfect fit for that population. That's what they're asking for now. That's what they're looking for. They want to drive less and they want to be able to get places easily. The Beltline provides them with that option. Look, we're making investments for our future. It's what Ronald Reagan did in 1983 when he doubled the gasoline tax and said that it's going to create 320,000 new jobs nationally. He was right. It worked. It did. It created a great system. We need to build on it. And that's what this is all about. We keep hearing about the Beltline being an economic development project. Let me tell you, Charles, if there's a project on this list that isn't an economic development project, we need to take it off. They're all economic development projects, and they're all economic development projects to the extent that they move goods and services more efficiently, and people, commuters through our region, all of them. Now, Jane Hayes with the ARC yeah. wants to chime in for a second sure. here. Go sure, ahead. Charles, thank you so much. I just want to say that the Atlanta Regional Commission has done an intensive technical analysis, both from an economic perspective and a transportation perspective, and it's all available on our website and we also have another website that you can get to it at www.metroatlantatransportationvote.com. In addition to that economic analysis and transportation analysis, we have all the information anyone needs to know about the project list itself. We have maps. You can Google the maps. You can fly in to where you live, where you work. You can look at all the projects, the information about all the projects. And I would like to say that this is a diverse set of projects for a diverse region. The transit projects are very diverse. We have Expre Greta Express Bus for the suburban commuters who are coming into downtown Atlanta in the list. There is also uh, bus rapid transit on I-20 East. There is light rail and there is local bus in Clayton County. So it's a wide variety of transit f uh, to fit the land use and density of that area as well as key roadway projects. There are really significant interstate interchange projects that are 
tremendous bottlenecks in our region that are on this list, such as I-285 and 400. And, you know, I dare say just about everybody in this region has gone through that interchange at one time or another. So many, many projects, and that's where folks can really go and get the information that, that the Atlanta Regional Commission has done. And, Steve, before you get a chance to respond, I do want to say that we have a question from Twitter about that list, and we'll get to that in a second. But, uh, Steve, Look, Jeff, go ahead. If I could briefly, yeah. um, <clears throat> ARC's economic model, I think there are some problems with the model. Um, there weren't 200,000 jobs that were going to be created. We shown that. It was job years they were referring to. The four to one benefit to the economy. They extended the benefits out decades, but unfortunately the operations and maintenance costs were only extended along the 10 years of the TSPLOS funding. You can't do that. That's not the way to run a model. Um, those are inaccurate numbers, four to one. But, you know, the list itself, you know, you, you've got to say, how are you going to pay for these projects? It's wonderful to dump a bag of projects out on a table and have great delight over these projects. But if you cannot afford to fund them, and MARTA can't afford to fund them now. You know, Jane has said in the past at the, at the uh, supporter report, there have to be other sources of funding to pay for operations and maintenance. Somebody please tell the voters before they go to vote, how are we going to pay for this? Well, let me ask Jane. When I, when I looked at the, um, uh, the the list, there's a there's a map on the Georgia Department of Transportation's website of all of the different projects, whether they're rail or roads. Mm -hmm. When you click on those, it either tells you that it's 100% funded by the uh, transportation tax, or it mm -hmm. tells you that it's partly funded by the tax or partly funded by a federal funding formula. Can you clear up for us how this uh, funding structure works? Sure, I'd be glad to. And let me start by saying that part of the roundtable process when the project list was developed was that it had to be constrained to a budget that was set by the state economist. The state economist had to actually forecast how much money he thought would be raised during this 10-year time period. So he took into account you know, the economic fluctuations and things like that. So this list was budgeted to the amount that was to be raised. So it's not a, a wish list of of all types of projects, um, it, it's actually budgeted to a certain dollar amount. Now, as far as those dollar amounts go, some of those projects are actually leveraging federal dollars. So, for f most folks don't under or don't realize that when we talk about federally funded projects, those projects are actually only 80 percent federal at the most. Some of them are only 50 percent federal, and then the local government or state has to come up with the match, either a 50 percent match if it's 50/50 or a 20 percent match. So in some cases, the um, Georgia DOT looked at the project list and determined that. Um, the TIA money could actually be the match, perhaps, for, for a project, or it could actually um, help fund, leverage federal money so the federal money could go further and, and, and we could use it for more projects in the future. Well, let, Jeff, let me ask you, based on what Jane just said, some of the money collected from the tax, if voters approve it, would be used to try to basically shake down a federal money tree, so oh. to speak. <laughs> What's to say that with some of these projects, we're going to get the kind of federal money that is anticipated to well, pay me, for let, this? Uh, what, let, me, let me turn that around, if I may. What are we going to get out of the federal government if we, don't, if we don't pass it? Okay, Lynn Westmoreland, one of the most conservative congressmen in this area, said that he had a conversation with the, sec the transportation secretary who said, look, if you want us to participate in helping you build a transportation system, you're going to have to make the investments yourself. And it was that conversation that gave Congressman Westmoreland from down in Noonan, in, in Sharpsburg, in, in, in Noonan County, I mean in Noonan, uh, Coweta County, um, that's what brought him around to supporting this tax. There are a lot of people who support this tax because they know that the only way that we are going to be able to go to Washington to leverage the federal dollars that we pay and bring them back to our region is if we go as a region together. We can't go, you know, uh, in, in these little blocks of, 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 of communities. We have to go together as a region if we want to really maximize leveraging federal funding 
to help us with our transportation problems. But let me and so I think that that's a better way of looking at it. Will we have more success if we made an eight and a half billion dollar investment than if we made a zero investment? Absolutely. But there are some people who want to know what sort of guarantee is there if we go to Washington, D.C. as a region and say, here's what we're planning, that we're guaranteed the money. Uh, well, let me to guarantee pay for some of these you projects. right now, Charles, that we will have far better chances <laughs> if we invest eight and a half billion of our own dollars than if we invest zero. Charles, Steve, I, Jeff is making the point it, that you're, you're <clears throat> better if you do as opposed to if you don't. Well, we at the Transportation Leadership Coalition would like to see transportation improvements, and we have no problems bringing in federal funding to help achieve that object, objective, as long as you have the right projects. Now, here's the problem. The federal highway fund was $70 billion in the red this year. And I'm very thankful that the Chinese government is willing to fund the United States of America because that's the only thing that's keeping the United States of America going right now. As a fiscal conservative, and I don't apologize for being a fiscal conservative, uh, you have got to look at what's coming down the pipe later on. And the federal government is drastically running out of highway funding, as Jane said earlier in her presentation. The highway funding is falling off a cliff. So depending on the life preserver uh, from the federal government is the wrong way to look at this. You have to have projects that we can honestly fund within our own means. And if we get the federal monies, then that's just gravy. We can help work on this. But let me tell you something about what the question you were asking with Jane. You were referring to implementation dollars coming from the federal government. I'm talking about the money that's used to operate and maintain the system. That is where MARTA is falling off drastically. You have to, it's one thing to build a system. It's another thing to run it in perpetuity. We do not have the ability to do that with the current system we have. And the federal government is not coming to our rescue. I want to throw it back to a Twitter question in just a second, but Jeff, I wanted to get your response to that. Steve is basically talking about fears that some in city governments and county governments have that once the transportation tax money is spent, the maintenance and operating costs would fall on them. And that the fear there, what's your response to that? You know, it, it, <clears throat> Steve's talking about it in the context of transit. It's also true within the context of roads. It's true in the context of anything that we build together as a community. If you have an education splashed and you build a school, that school is going to need a roof or an air conditioning unit long after your splashed has expired. We have maintenance and operations expenses. I don't think that there's any question about it. But we also have a tremendous uptrend and interest in young people investing and riding and using transit as well as roads. And if we have more people, and the trend is strong, 40% increase in eight years, the trend is strong. We have more and more people using transit that's is that more a national money. number or is that's that a, a national number? It's a, it's a national number. It's a national number. It shows nationally that young people around the United States are changing the way we commute, the way we think about transportation, and the way we get to work. And that's why the Beltline is so important. That's why having a balanced project list is so important. It's not all roads. It's not all transit. We've got people on both sides who wanted to be all roads and all transit. They both want to come back in two years and think that they're going to come together miraculously somehow. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen in two years. It's not going to happen in four years or ten. We're still going to have people who stress roads and people who stress transit. What we have is a balanced list. Now, first, let's go to a Twitter question and to remind our viewing audience watching this on WABE or WABE.org right now, you can ask your question on our website. You can also tweet your question to at WABE News on Twitter. Use the hashtag WABE Debate at the end of your tweet. And also you can leave your question on our wall on our Facebook page, which is WABE News. Josh Combs is one of our Twitter followers, and he asked us, how can voters be assured that the project list will say the same and not change? Jane, I want to throw that to you. Great. Thanks, Charles. That is part of the Transportation Investment Act law. This is a commitment to the people that these projects would be built, underway or built within a 10 year time frame. That was the commitment made by the roundtable and essentially the 
um, intent of the law that this this project list your the people will be voting on this set of projects to be built or underway in the 10 year time period. I will say that part of the criteria, part of the roundtable negotiations that were happening included the discussion about operations and maintenance um, for transit projects. And that included 10 years of operation and maintenance for transit projects. So the cost included in this project list, these projects are all fully funded in the project list, includes 10 years of operations and maintenance. Let's keep going with the questions here. This came from P. Snyder via WABE.org chat room. He has a question for Steve Brown. He wants to know, would you agree that more roads are only a short-term congestion solution? I think we're going to have to take a serious look at our surface road network. I mean, obviously, we have some impediments. When you combine two major arterial interstates in the center of a downtown, you are begging for trouble. Uh, we have got to look at something else for... Um, for that type of thing. Bus rapid transit, I think it's a viable option. And if we build dedicated lanes for bus rapid transit, the Georgia Regional Transportation Authority had a plan in 2004, which had a bus rapid transit plan. And unfortunately, it was never moved upon. Um, but the projects that we have in the list are not the solution. It's just not going to do it. Now, you know, I'm glad that Jane says there's 10 years of <clears throat> maintenance and operations built into the, the SPLOS. But one thing you have to remember is you can't assure the projects on a SPLOS that aren't fully funded. It won't happen. Now, we've never had a rail project come out on budget. Nowhere close. Not in the history of MARTA. So to think that those funds aren't going to be used and borrowed. Now, with the citizen review panel, a lot of people are saying if we can't get the, four, uh, the Georgia 400 toll booths closed as the government promised us when they implemented the, the plan and as Governor Deal promised when he ran for office. Why should we trust this? Well, Steve, let me ask you, you also talked about how you are critical of this list, saying that it doesn't solve the original problem with traffic congestion. Uh, ben Stark on our Facebook page asked earlier in the day, I think everybody acknowledges the problems with transportation in Atlanta and how they're weighing down our economy. Um, he wants to know what is your alternative for dealing with this transportation problem if this list is not the answer? And, you know, that's an excellent question. <clears throat> I've got a whole sh let me go over some of the things that are not in this list, that are no-brainers, that should absolutely be included. Telecommuting. Do you know we have more people that telecommute in metropolitan Atlanta than ride transit? But yet the state and the region does not do one thing to subsidize or incentivize people telecommuting. So the tax should be a subsidy for telecommuting? Is that the part of the proposal? This is part of our transportation conversation we need to be having. Um, we're, not, we're not including that at all. Um, the expansion of flexible work hours. You know, I get tired. I, I think it's a little hypocritical of the Metropolitan Atlanta Chamber of Commerce to be crying about traffic, but yet they demand 8 to 5, 9 to 5, whatever, you know, their work hours are. They have got to create flexible hours. You know, a clerk at the corporate office at Home Depot doesn't have to be there at 9 to 5. They can be there at 10 to 6. They could be there at 6 to 3. They could actually go home and pick up their children from daycare at a decent hour instead of having to pay the penalty for being late. We've got to see flexible work hours, and the business community needs to step up. But the other things, you know, the cost-benefit analysis, the hot lanes and the tolls, we don't have a problem with putting tolls on roads. We think it's a logical thing to do, a logical way to pay for it. But it's not in this conversation. But I tried to convince my state rep one day, who represents Fayette County, about telecommuting, incentivizing it. And I was trying to explain it to him. He stopped me and he said, don't worry, my wife's already doing it. She works for one of the top three accounting firms. She gets to see the kids come off the school bus every day. It's one of the things that keeps her work and working in that office. And they get a high quality employee for doing that. Now, I know you've got a long list there. We probably cannot sure. get to all of them. And I know, Jane, you wanted to add something. But real quickly, uh, uh, Jeff, Steve brought up the issue of tolls, and specifically Georgia 400. Um, that is also an issue for Greg Trumbull of Facebook, uh, who, who gave us his question earlier in the day. He wrote, we were told the toll on 400 would expire <clears throat> after the bonds that built the road were paid for. The road has since been paid off, yet we are still paying the toll. 
why should we believe the 1% sales tax increase will be any different? Did you vote for it? Did you vote to put it there in the first place? Did you vote to, to take it down? You didn't have a vote. You didn't have a vote the first time around. You didn't have a vote when they decided to keep it up. Here you have a vote. That's the difference. It's a big difference. We have 157 projects. They do not change. Plus, plus the 15% that folks have, in, uh, that, that, that counties have, to make other improvements, sidewalk improvements, fill potholes, uh, expand lanes, uh, update traffic signalization. But that's the difference, Charles. It's the difference between having an opportunity to vote on whether or not you're going to make an investment and not having the opportunity. And with Georgia 400, no one had that opportunity. This is completely different from Georgia 400, and I think that listeners need to understand that. Now, you've talked about the difference that you can vote on these. No one voted on 400. But what I've heard some people say as far as their concern with transportation funding is that the same elect that elected leaders put together, you know, toll lanes for a stated purpose and elected leaders put together this list. So if elected leaders put together this list, not the same elected leaders, but just elected officials themselves, What's to say, and this is a concern that people have, what's to say that once the tax is, is, is collected, that it won't be collected again down the road? I don't think that it was embedded in state statute that you had to take down the toll at any particular time. These 157 projects are. You can't change this list. Jane, you wanted to add something. Yes, um, I'm really glad that Steve brought up those alternatives because he's exactly right. There are many alternatives to solving our transportation congestion problems. And the, this is, honestly, this isn't the only game in town, believe it or not. We have a long-range transportation plan in the Atlanta region, as I referenced before. And many of the alternatives that Steve laid out are in the long-range plan. The long-range plan is based on a system of managed lanes, of hot lanes, um, throughout our interstates. Also, telecommuting and flexible hours, it's all part of something called travel demand because we've been talking about supply, but you also have the demand and you have to marry the two. De limiting that demand on our transportation assets is just as important as providing supply. And um, that is a very important part and component of the transportation um, Atlanta Regional Transportation Plan and the work we do, the Clean Air Campaign and other um, nonprofits throughout this region are continually trying to encourage folks to telework. Our tra um, transportation management associations within our major employment centers are working on that as well. So um, just want to point out that those are very important solutions, but there's no one silver bullet that's going to solve our transportation congestion, and that's why having this opportunity is also um, very important. Charles, if I may, one crucial point that we need to consider that really hasn't surfaced. Most of these projects, uh, my, the road projects in particular, uh, were already slated for some form of funding from Georgia DOT. They're on the plan somewhere in some year. What we are wondering is, what happens to those DOT funds? They still collect those funds from the federal gas tax. And we have asked DOT on several occasions to provide the list to show us where those funds go. One thing we're very concerned about is that $1.5 billion a year, whatever that number is, gets converted into a slush fund for port projects that local legislative people want in their districts. And that is not going to help our traffic congestion. In the name of honest government, they need to provide us with a list of what they plan to do with those federal monies. Jeff, Steve is basically bringing up the question, why should we trust the state? Why should we trust the Georgia Department of Transportation to see all of this through? What's your response to that? Well, you know, you've got Greta overlooking the transit projects. You've got the Georgia Department of Transportation overlooking uh, uh, the, the road projects. You know, I remember back in the days when we had $600 hammers in the Defense Department. What are we going to do? Shut down defense? You fix the problem when you see these kinds of abuses. You fix them. You don't say government can't do it. We have to do it together. This is a fundamental responsibility of government. Who else are we going to bring in to do it? I get on the Internet and I hear that the private sector should do it. You know, the private sector does do it through contracting. 
and through hiring everyday citizens to go out there and work on these projects. But the fact of the matter is we have government, we elect our leaders, we have the opportunity to unelect our leaders if they don't do what we ask them to do. And to the extent that they're our representatives and they're representing our interests when they develop a list of 157 projects, I think that we need to go with that. We really don't have any other model, Charles, that I know of in order to come together and collectively build things that are in the public interest and that help us all. And that's what road building, transportation building is all about. Justine Semple asked a question on our website, wabe.org. Justine asked, how will funding this tax keep people off the interstates? What's a concrete example? Um, Jane, I'm, was there any sort of uh, analysis done to say that uh, some of these projects will result in traffic congestion? Yes, Charles, that is part of the transportation analysis that the Atlanta Regional Commission did. As soon as the roundtable developed the 157 projects, we then took that and with our technical tools, our travel demand model that we run uh, on a regular basis, we compared what the results would be with this, this set of projects being completed by the year 2025 versus not having this set of projects. And what we see, we do see an overall system decrease in congestion. However, I think the most important piece is, because the system, nobody travels the whole system every day. However, when you look at the actual roads that are being improved on the project list, we see an, on average about 24, 25% decrease in delay um, on, the, on those roads with, with actual improvements. Now, Steve, uh, Jane has just talked about some analysis here. I know one of the main points that uh, the Transportation Leadership Coalition has made is that elected officials, mayors and county commissioners came up with this list, not engineers. But it seems like there was some analysis done here. Why are some of these projects not worth the funding? Well, you, when you're talking about relieving traffic congestion with transit, um, the Wall Street Journal quoted a Brookings Institute study that said since 1982, government has poured $750 billion in today's dollars worth of subsidies into mass transit, and yet the ridership has gone down by a full third. So to say we're going to get these increases now, here's the th other thing. I have a real problem with the forecasting at ARC. Um, a Cox and Creasy report from 2000 showed that their predictions for 2025, okay, and we're almost there, um, they, want, they projected that bus ridership was going to increase by 70% by 2025 without adding a single bus. That's preposterous. That's out of the universe. There's no way that can happen. It hasn't happened anywhere in the United States of America. Now, they also said that ridership was estimated to increase more than 40% from 20 to 25. It's going in the opposite direction. So, you know, I have real trouble using some of these projections because from what I'm seeing from previous projections, we're not anywhere close to those marks. So when you build a new rail line, what normally happens, and this is just, you know, transportation 101, when you build a new rail line, what happens is you get a lot of the people that come off the buses and they'll ride the rail instead. There's no increase in the amount. You might get an increase in rail ridership, but it's not an increase in removing cars from the road. Jeff, Steve just talked about the fact that he thinks there's a negative impact when you uh, create some of these uh, some of these rail projects and that it will sort of offset, it won't really make a dent in this congestion. I think that we're looking at, again, we're looking at static numbers. I, I, I'd really like for people and encourage people to think about the future. You know, transportation investment is a long-term investment. It takes a long time to build a road. It takes a long time to build a transportation system. And we had generations before us who made the investment and paid the taxes so that we can enjoy the transportation in infrastructure we currently have, the interstate system, the transit that we have. We need to be able to do the same thing for the next generation of folks. We're not talking about the 4% who use, who use transit right now. We're not talking about those numbers. We're talking about creating a system that everyone can use in the future. We're talking about trends and how people commute, where they want to live, and how they want to live. 
and the trend is very clear. They don't want to live way out anymore and, and, and commute 60 miles. They want to live in town. They don't want necessarily to have to have a car. Maybe they'll want a scooter, but they definitely want options. And that's what this plan gives them. It gives them options. It's a balanced plan of roads and transit that serves our needs now and into the future. And that's what we need. And we need to start someplace. Jane's talking about $66 billion in needs. This is $8.5 billion, and people are saying it doesn't do everything that we want it to do. Well, it's not going to at $8.5 billion. All right. Well, we've got about five minutes left in the debate that you're watching right now on WABE.org. We've been getting a lot of questions from our website, on Twitter, and on Facebook throughout the day and during the debate. We won't have time to get to all of the questions during the debate, but we will get you answers after the debate ends and throughout the days and weeks to come before the July 31st transportation sales tax referendum. With about five minutes left, I do want to throw it back to the panel for closing statements. And since Jeff just finished, Steve, I'll start with you uh, from the Transportation Leadership Coalition. Uh, give your closing arguments for why people should not vote for this tax. Well, I'll address some of Jeff's points in my closing. Um, I don't expect everyone to adhere to my conservative fiscal values, but I think at some point we have to be able to draw a financial line because we as elected officials have a fiduciary responsibility to the taxpayer. Um, if we're going to bring in transit at a cost that's exponentially higher than the alternatives, some of these telecommuting and things like that are virtually free. But we have to respect that. Now, this report, a common sense approach to transportation in the Atlanta region, said the incremental cost per new ride was $13,600 annually for each new commuter rising, riding transit. Somewhere, you have got to draw the line and say, at this point, it is no longer feasible for us to be supporting a losing entity. Now, in relation to that, there are private alternatives, and it mesmerizes me by the fact that Megabus can take someone from Atlanta to Athens, give them a comfortable seat and a bus that's packed because people want to use it. They have Wi-Fi capacity. They have outlets for their laptop computers and their iPads, and they do it for $2.50 and make a profit. MARTA will take you from Midtown to Buckhead for $2.50, um, and they'll lose millions and billions of dollars. That is the problem. All right, that was Steve Brown from the Transportation Leadership Coalition giving his closing statements during our transportation sales tax referendum debate. Now we go to Jeff Dickerson from Citizens for Transportation Mobility. Thank you, Charles, and thank you again for the opportunity to be here and to educate uh, listeners and, and viewers on this important issue. You know, Steve talked about fiscal conservatism. Ronald Reagan was a fiscal conservative. Uh, he doubled the gas tax, the federal gas tax, and invested billions of dollars in our transportation system so that we could enjoy the transportation system that we have today. It created 320,000 new jobs. We know that by following his record and his model in our region that we will attract jobs, that we will create new jobs in the process of this, uh, of, uh, of, the, the construction jobs alone, 34,000 construction jobs, but that will attract jobs and will attract families from around the nation and the globe. This is a popular place to be. We've got a world-class airport. We're known to have a world-class transportation system. We haven't made the kind of investment in that transportation system that we need to have. Now is the time for us to take that first step eight and a half billion toward the 66 billion that Jane says that we need. Now is the time for us to make the kind of investments for the future, for ourselves now and for the future that generations before us, us have done. It's time for us to do that. I urge all folks to go out and vote for this on July 31 to vote yes for it. But I especially urge young people to go out and vote uh, yes on July 31st because it's going to affect them and their future and their families and their businesses far more than it will mine and Steve's. <laughs> and Jane, finally, uh, again, that was uh, Jeff Dickerson with Citizens for Transportation Mobility with his closing argument. Finally, uh, Jane Hayes, your closing statement sure. from the Atlanta Regional Commission. Sure, and thank you, Charles. You know, it's really very simple. People need to be informed, 
They need to know what the project list says, what they are voting for, and what impact it will have on them. The ARC, the Atlanta Regional Commission, is made up of about 150 professional planners. We have degrees in planning, PhDs, master's degrees. We, we our, our computer models are state of the art. They've passed muster with the federal government. And we've put out information for folks. It's out there on www.metroatlantatransportationvote.com. You can also go to atlantaregional.com. Read the reports and decide for yourself. All right, well, that was Jane Hayes, the Transportation Director from the Atlanta Regional Commission, giving our final closing statement of our transportation sales tax referendum debate. Again, we thank you for all of the questions that you submitted on wabe.org, on Twitter, and on Facebook. We unfortunately did not have enough time to get to your question during the debate, but we want you to keep the conversation going on our website and on Twitter and on Facebook as well, at WABE News on Twitter and our Facebook page, WABE News, where we will get you answers to your questions between now and the transportation referendum on July 31st. If you did not get a chance to watch the entire debate, we will archive this on our website, wabe.org, and you will be able to see it throughout uh, the month of July. Our thanks to our panel, and thanks to you for viewing and asking questions as well. I'm Charles Edwards from WABE News. Thanks for watching.